Throughout history, people have gone missing without explanation, some of whom are never seen again. While some of these cases have plausible explanations, others are more inexplicable, as they've offered up no clues or witnesses and they remain unsolved decades later. Number 5. Whenever a person goes missing, the police usually look at friends and family members first to see if they were involved somehow. In many of these cases, there is a dispute or argument that led up to the disappearance, and any clues from those interactions could be vital to locating them. The disappearance of 40-year-old Amber Manthorne took place on the 7th of July 2022, and at first, investigators were baffled and asked for the public's assistance in the case. But it's since come to light that someone close to her may have been responsible. Amber hails from Port Alberni, Vancouver Island, one of the country's largest islands. Her older sister Shannon describes her as a fun-loving and spirited person who kept everyone on their toes when she was a child. She added that Amber was someone who worked hard, made sure to look after herself, and who had a lot to look forward to in her life, since she decided to possibly get married and have children one day, something that did not appeal to her in the past. She was well known and liked in her community, and her family states that people still come up to them in the streets, often to ask if there's been any developments in her case, despite it being more than two years old. It's unclear who reported Amber missing, but sources state that this was done on the 8th of July, 2022, after she'd not been seen or heard from for more than 24 hours. That's when the Royal Canadian Mounted Police made an appeal to the public to be on the lookout for her while they started their investigation. The following day, her family became even more concerned for her well-being when her car, a white 2021 Jeep Compass, was found abandoned just south of Nanaimo, and the case was handed over to the Vancouver Island Integrated Major Crime Unit. Following this, Amber's family, friends, and volunteers from the community started a search in the backcountry areas between Port Alberni and Nanaimo, where her Jeep was found. The search lasted for weeks, but no further clues were found. During interviews with those close to her, it was revealed that Amber was likely in the company of her boyfriend, Justin Hall, and that he was likely the last one to see her before she vanished. But when investigators spoke to him, he stated that he hadn't seen her that day, and that he had no idea what may have happened to her. Unfortunately, Justin passed away shortly before the one-year anniversary of Amber's disappearance, though it's not been revealed how he lost his life. This means that any information he may have had on the case is now forever lost. Investigators have since asked that anyone who was close to Justin and who may have information on the case come forward, since he's now considered to be the number one suspect in her disappearance. Thanks to further leads that were uncovered during the investigation, which includes some very suspicious activity that was captured by CCTV security cameras. The footage was obtained from a Husky gas station on 3rd Avenue and has since been released to the public in case they have more information on what is seen in the video. It shows Amber's Jeep arriving at the gas station, but when the driver steps out, it's Justin, not Amber. He's then seen opening the driver's side back door and removing a large blue suitcase from the back seat. He takes it to the back of the car, opens the trunk, and attempts to put it in the trunk. But as is seen in the footage, he's unable to fit it due to a large plastic tote that's already in the trunk. And after many unsuccessful attempts, he's forced to return the suitcase to the back seat. Neither the plastic tote nor the suitcase have ever been found and it's unclear whether they'll shed light on anything in the case. But investigators feel strongly that they will. They believe there is foul play involved and that Justin knew what had happened to her. They've since released a timeline in the case starting on the 7th of July when Amber was captured on security footage at 3.27 p.m. inside of a Buy Low Foods in Port Alberni. She made a few purchases at the store and was then seen leaving in her car. Her Jeep was seen again driving west on Pacific Rim Highway at 3.35 p.m. And shortly after, she arrived at her house, and she's never seen again. The next day, at 12.22 a.m., Justin made a call to United Cabs where he ordered a taxi. The cab was seen heading in a westerly direction. Keep in mind, this was just after midnight. About four hours later, at 4.17 a.m., Amber's car is seen driving on the Pacific Rim Highway, headed in the direction of Port Alberni. 
Following this, he traveled to the gas station, where he was seen trying to rearrange the luggage that he had in the vehicle. The Jeep is then seen once again at a McDonald's restaurant on Johnston Road, where Justin buys some food at 7.02 a.m. An hour later, Amber's colleagues realized that she didn't show up for work, and at 9.22 a.m., Justin was seen buying items at a Walmart in Nanaimo. This was about four and a half hours after he was captured by cameras at the gas station. His suspicious behavior continued after this, as he was clearly planning on traveling to the mainland in Amber's Jeep without informing anyone. It's known that he purchased a ferry ticket at the Duke Point Terminal, after which he fell in behind the other cars that were waiting to be loaded. But then he seemingly had second thoughts, as he could be seen leaving the queue just after 11 a.m., never getting on the ferry and driving away. The next day, investigators were informed that the Jeep had been found, but that Amber was nowhere to be seen. Searches were conducted in the areas surrounding the car, but nothing further was found. Investigators stated that they believe Amber owned a phone case that held several bank and credit cards, and have asked the public to be on the lookout for it, since it was never found. Justin's cell phone was also never recovered. Strangely, Amber's phone pinged off several towers in the Albany Valley area for days after she disappeared, and it may be a vital clue in the case. The authorities have since revealed that they believe Amber is no longer alive, and that she likely met with foul play, possibly at the hands of her boyfriend, but since he can't be interviewed, this remains speculation. Investigators have asked that anyone with information on the case contact the Port Albany RCMP at 250-723-2424, quoting police file number 2022-6674. Alternatively, you can contact Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Number 4. Some missing person investigations turn cold for decades before a new lead is found which is the case in the disappearance of Alex Slowley, who went missing on the 2nd of August 2008, mere days before he was supposed to celebrate his 17th birthday. At the time, Alex, who's known to his friends as Gog, was living in Islington, London, while studying math and accountancy at City and Islington College, and by all accounts was considered to be a very intelligent person. He was known to take care of his appearance and was always dressed nice. When he went missing, his parents had gotten separated and he was one of four siblings, the other three being sisters, Tasha, Tazra, and Latina. Just before he vanished, Alex had been staying with one of his friends in Edmonton, North London, but he set out for home at around 12 in the afternoon on the 2nd of August to start preparations for his birthday. He never made it home and his family became concerned that something untoward may have happened to him. They knew that he didn't have any money on him and that he didn't even have a change of clothes, though he did have his cell phone with him. But soon after he was reported missing, the phone either ran out of battery or was turned off and hence couldn't be tracked. His family told investigators that it was very out of character for Alex to remain out of touch for an extended period of time and that he didn't have any reason to run away from home. CCTV footage of the area was scoured through by investigators, but he wasn't picked up by any cameras either in Islington or Edmonton. No one had seen him, and his family stated that it was as if he simply vanished into thin air without explanation. In 2009, a member of the public contacted investigators to report that they had seen Alex in Ilford, but this lead was followed up on and nothing further came of it. Alex's photo was then added to milk cartons thanks to the Missing People charity and the Iceland supermarket chain. But despite his image appearing on more than 13 million of these cartons, he remained missing. His family has since criticized the police for the manner in which Alex's disappearance was investigated. In 2015, his mother Narissa learned that there had been several reports of Alex being cited in 2009, but she was never informed of this. Strangely, more than 16 years after he went missing, one of Alex's friends came forward in 2024 to reveal that he'd been involved in the selling of illegal substances at a low level, and this suggests that he may have gotten involved with some dangerous people or gangs, and that this may have resulted in his life being ended. But his family has refuted these claims. The friend with whom Alex had been staying in North London has since stated that he's noticed discrepancies between reports of his last movements and what actually happened on the day that he disappeared. He states that Alex was actually somewhere else in London after leaving his house and that he had not traveled back to his house yet. 
He's also revealed that he and Alex have been selling illegal substances for some time, since it was one of the few ways they had to make money. He added that they used to sell the substances in the Ilford and Barking areas. This was confirmed by another of his friends, who added that Alex was always looking to make some cash, on one occasion getting paid nearly $2,000 from a den called The Base. According to this friend and a few others, this is where Alex had traveled to after leaving North London, and he's never been seen or heard from since. But Narissa stated that Alex has never been involved with these types of people, and that if he'd made money selling these substances, he would have had money for expensive clothes, which he never did. But investigators say that they tend to believe Alex's friend's version of events since the case has followed the same narrative as many others where people became involved with the wrong types of people, only to end up going missing or worse. They made reference to county lines, which they describe as a ruthless organization that employs people to smuggle illegal substances from one particular area to another. They added that the members of this group demand loyalty and that if they're crossed, they wouldn't think twice about ending someone's life. But for the time being, Alex's disappearance is still being investigated as a missing person case, as many people feel he simply chose to disappear to start a new life somewhere else. One detective who's working on the case has stated that he's hopeful that Alex is still alive somewhere, and that he's simply chosen to stay out of touch with his friends and family. He believes there is a possibility that he's chosen to not use his bank accounts or cell phone for this very reason. But until further clues are found, there's no way of knowing whether this is the case. Alex's father has since passed away without ever finding out what happened to his son, and his sister Latina has stated that she remains hopeful that he is still alive and that he'll simply walk back into the family's home one day, as unlikely as that may be. 16 years have now passed since Alex went missing and an age progression photo has been made available to the public to show what he would look like now in case he is spotted. No further leads have ever been received in Alex's case, and investigators have asked that anyone who sees him or who has information on where he may be come forward by contacting the police. Number 3. It's often the case when someone goes missing that family members and friends become frustrated with the progress of the investigation. This is usually because no new clues have been found, or because the authorities are waiting for evidence to be processed. This can be a very frustrating time for everyone involved, since investigators want to close the case for good, and the missing person's family wants their loved one to be found. But sometimes, no matter how much evidence is found, the case goes cold, and is never solved. The disappearance of 44-year-old Mark Murensack is one such case that seemingly stalled, and 18 years later, there's been very little progress. His sister Valeria has repeatedly voiced her frustration in this regard, stating that the detectives who are investigating the case have failed to communicate with her regularly. But the authorities have stated that they haven't updated Valeria because there have been no new developments in the case, despite their ongoing investigation, and the addition of a $5,000 reward to anyone who comes forward with information leading to Mark being found, or the case being solved. Mark's disappearance took place on the 30th of September, 2006, and his case contains some very baffling and confusing elements. During that time, he was working as a stock handler at a Walmart in Slippery Rock Township in Lawrence County, Pennsylvania. For 18 years prior to that, he'd been working for the U.S. Postal Service, but one day he simply decided to resign without giving any reason. He was described by his fellow employees at the post office as a hard worker, and for months after he disappeared, Valeria would receive calls from other post offices who wanted to employ him, thanks to his good employee record. Five months prior to his disappearance, he'd been living with Valeria in Slippery Rock. Their father had passed away, and the two siblings, who were ten years apart in age, decided to move into his house together. The night before his disappearance, Mark asked Valeria to wake him up at 8 a.m. after arriving home from work at around 11.15 p.m., presumably so that he could get ready to go to work for an early shift. She agreed but never got the chance to do this, as she was woken up at 6 a.m. and received some alarming news. State troopers had knocked on her door to inform her that they'd found a truck, believed to be Mark's, abandoned on a bridge in Taylor Township, specifically on the Route 422 bypass. When the truck was searched, the keys were found to still be in the ignition, and it was eventually confirmed that the truck did indeed belong to her brother. 
Startled by this news and believing that his truck may have been stolen and then abandoned, Valeria went to Mark's room and found that he wasn't there. The area around the truck was thoroughly searched, but no sign of Mark was found, and there were no clues as to where he may have gone. In the days that followed, more searches were conducted, with the help of more than 40 firefighters, state police officers, and volunteers. Helicopters were brought in to search from the air, and search dogs attempted to find Mark's scent, but with no result. It was speculated that Mark decided to end his own life and jumped over the bridge, but investigators stated that they had no proof that this was what happened and decided to keep searching. But they did note that Shenango River, which flows under the bridge, was swollen at the time, resulting in very strong and dangerous currents that could sweep anyone away if they were unfortunate enough to end up in the water. When this avenue of the investigation failed to produce any result, Valeria decided to search for him in the surrounding homeless camps, thinking that he may have decided to vanish of his own accord, but again, no sign of Mark was found. She also got in contact with dam operators in and around Pittsburgh to inform them that her brother may have ended up in the river and that they should keep a lookout for him. This also didn't lead anywhere, and before long, Mark's case went cold. Some people have suggested that Mark may have been feeling depressed following his father's passing and that he decided to end his own life as a result. But since nothing was ever found in the water, this theory remains speculative. This is when Valeria started to get frustrated with the investigation. She stated that the searches were abruptly stopped and no one returned to help her look for Mark, causing her to become even more despondent. Furthermore, none of the investigators ever contacted her to update her on the progress, and she felt that Mark's case had been shelved and forgotten, leaving her as the only one still looking for him. Furthermore, she stated that she was unable to get any answers when she inquired why the searches had been called off. When she and a reporter contacted investigators on the same day to ask about the progress in the case, a sergeant who was not involved in the investigation stated that they felt they were being harassed and could offer no further information. It became clear that Mark's case had gone cold and nothing more could be done without additional clues, though investigators assured Valeria that all missing person cases would remain open until the missing person is either found or declared deceased, and they would continue to follow up on any new leads that are received. Then, in July of 2024, Valeria learned that a Facebook page called PSP Tips an affiliate of the Pennsylvania State Police, posted a photo of Mark, along with the news that a $5,000 reward is being offered for information, leading to him being found. This took her by surprise, as no one had spoken to her about the case for a long time, and she contacted the police, who told her that this was being done in an effort to drum up new leads, something that's often done during cold case investigations, in case it jogs someone's memory. In November of 2023, Skeletal remains were found in a wooded area in Pulaski Township, and they were sent for testing, but investigators told Valeria that they likely belonged to a man who'd gone missing in Ohio, and were almost certainly not linked to Mark's disappearance. Mark remains missing today, and it seems that his case may never be solved. Valeria and investigators are still hopeful that they will find new evidence one day, and that the case will move forward. But sadly, for the time being, nothing more can be done. Valeria stated that when Mark went to bed that night, he was wearing jeans, a gray t-shirt, and a navy sweatshirt as he did every night, and he was likely still dressed this way when he left the house. Mark would currently be 62 years old and is described as having brown hair with hazel eyes, standing 6 foot 6 inches tall and weighing 200 pounds. His name as case number is MP55661. Number 2. The Disappearance of 43-Year-Old Anna Machievsky from Malvern, Pennsylvania was at first thought to be a routine missing person investigation. But a year after she vanished, it was upgraded to a homicide investigation when some disturbing information came to light. Anna originally hails from Poland, and a few weeks before she vanished, she'd been planning to go back there for a visit, since her father's 80th birthday was coming up. She'd been in steady contact with her family while working as an actuary in the U.S. She had a four-year-old son and, according to her co-workers, was diligent in her duties and got along well with everyone. She immigrated to the United States in 1997, after which she started studying at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. 
She had already attained two bachelor's degrees from Warsaw University, but furthered her education in the US as she wanted to obtain a master's degree in mathematics. She soon found a job with Avoya Financial, known then as ING. And following this, her relationship with her boyfriend, who'd come to the US with her, ended. On one occasion, she decided to go on a ski trip, where she would meet Alan Gould, the man who she would eventually marry. Their relationship was doing well until 2016, when she unfortunately had a miscarriage, an event that understandably had an adverse effect on her mental state. The couple's relationship started to deteriorate, with Anna feeling that Alan wasn't being supportive. He was spending a lot of time looking after their son, for whom Anna was trying to get a Polish passport, so that he could get to know her parents when they visited them in their home country. This caused further trouble in the relationship, since Alan didn't want their son to become a dual citizen. And after a while, she resorted to attending support groups where she could speak openly about her problems and the issues in her marriage. This is something that her friends and family would only be made aware of later. On the 28th of March, 2017, Anna had a conversation with her mother on the phone, in which she stated that she wanted to fly home to surprise her father for his birthday, along with Alan and their son. She seemed very excited about the trip, and stated that she would let her mother know all the details once they had been arranged. But strangely, on the 29th of March, she sent a text message to her mother that simply read, Sorry, I can't come. Kisses, Anna. The message was sent in Polish. Then, on the 30th, Anna's father received a text from her number, wishing him a happy birthday. But the message seemed suspicious, since it was written in badly worded Polish, a mistake that Anna would never have made since she was fluent in her native tongue. Her parents immediately started suspecting that the message was typed by someone pretending to be Anna, and they immediately tried to call her but got no answer. Over the next few days, they tried in vain to contact her, and they started to worry that something had happened to her. They managed to contact Alan, who then told them that Anna wasn't feeling well, but he promised to have her call them when she was feeling better. Anna's manager told investigators that he received a text message from her on the 3rd of April in which she informed him that she would not be coming to work that week. But this message also raised suspicion since he and Anna's co-workers knew she would have called under normal circumstances, rather than send a text. The week passed by, and she was expected to be back at work on the 10th of April, but didn't show. Alan then claimed that she'd recovered, and she was ready to go back to work, but that she had run out of their house that morning in a state of panic. He assumed that she was late for work, but was then told that she never arrived for her shift. Anna's manager started to suspect something was wrong, and he contacted the police, who traveled to the couple's house to perform a welfare check, but no one was home. When she didn't arrive for work again the next day, her manager, not Alan, reported her as missing. Alan did open a missing person case the next day, after calling Anna's parents and telling them that she had gone to work the previous morning and never come home. When asked why he waited so long, he stated that he was waiting to see if she came back. When the house was searched, Anna's phone, passport, and wallet were found, something that her friends found very strange, since she usually had these items with her. A Facebook page was created to raise awareness about her disappearance. When Alan found out about this, he became upset and stated that he wanted nothing to do with the social media campaigns, adding even more suspicion. Unfortunately, the page didn't result in any leads. On the 8th of May, Anna's car, a blue 2011 Audi A4, was found abandoned in the most unlikely of areas the parking lot of a hiking trail in a private community called Charlestown Meadows Development. The car had been backed into the parking space, something that Anna's friends stated that she would never do. The car was searched, as were the areas surrounding it, but nothing was found. The trail was then also searched, but with the same result, despite the assistance of volunteers from the community. Alan aided in the search, but then stopped cooperating with the police. Investigators learned that Anna had a second house that she and Alan used for storage, and in 2019, a search warrant was issued for it to be searched. It wasn't revealed what was found in the house, but as soon as the search was completed, investigators revealed that the case had been upgraded to a homicide investigation, and that Alan was a person of interest. Investigators revealed that they had proof that Alan was being less than truthful about what he knew, since he had information that could progress the case but refused to cooperate. 
He also refused to speak to any of her friends, colleagues, or reporters, and has not given a reason as to why. Anna's disappearance has had an adverse effect on her parents' health, but they remain hopeful that she is still alive and will eventually be found. A $30,000 reward is being offered to anyone who comes forward with information, leading to Anna's case being solved. Anna is described as having brown shoulder-length hair and hazel eyes, standing 5 foot 4 inches tall and weighing 160 pounds. Unfortunately, it isn't known what she was wearing at the time that she went missing, but is known to wear an engagement ring and a wedding band. If you or anyone you know has information on this case, you're asked to contact the Pennsylvania State Police at 610-486-6280. Anna's NamUs case number is MP38570. Number 1. Before she disappeared in April of 2024, 61-year-old Christina Asse was working as a nurse at the Rosie Lynn Care Center in West Lynn, Oregon. Her co-workers have taken it upon themselves to find as much information on her case as possible, since they consider her to be like a family member, and it's clear that she was liked by those close to her. They describe her as a kind person who never uttered a bad word about anyone, and given the profession that she chose to follow, it's obvious she cared about others, especially people who could no longer care for themselves. Christina moved to the U.S. from Argentina in the mid-2000s. She'd found living in Argentina hard and hoped to find a better, more comfortable life in the U.S. She was certain that she wouldn't struggle to find work, since she'd already worked as a biochemist in the past. But when she arrived in the U.S., she couldn't speak English and found a job as a cook at a care facility. When her employers noticed that she was a good worker, they offered her a promotion, and she started organizing patients' medical records. But she was far from content with this job, and in the meantime, kept studying, eventually earning her qualification as a registered nurse and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Shortly after that, she attained a degree as a Doctor of Medical Science. Those who worked with Christina told investigators that she used to treat her patients as if they were her family, often going far and above the call of duty to help them. Her disappearance has affected many people, including her patients, co-workers, family, and the surrounding community. On the 25th of March, the day before she disappeared, Christina arrived at work as usual. She had a cup of coffee and sat down with some of her colleagues for lunch, reminding them that they had a training day the next day, which she was excited to attend. But the next morning, at 6.34 a.m., she texted a colleague to say that she would be an hour late for her shift and would be arriving at 8.30 a.m. but didn't say why. Two of her closest co-workers, Amy and Nicole, the colleague's daughters, found this strange, since Christina would usually text all three of them at the same time, but hadn't done so on this occasion. Both Amy and Nicole started to worry when Christina still hadn't arrived for work more than two hours late. They felt that something was wrong, so they tried to contact her by calling and texting but got no replies. They then reported her absence to their boss, who decided to call Christina's husband, since he was listed on her employee form as her emergency contact. He was as surprised as they were to learn that Christina had planned to go to work late, and it had now become clear that something sinister was going on. Having not heard from her either, her husband contacted the police and reported Christina as missing. She's not been in contact with anyone, and given the fact that she used to speak to her sisters on the phone every day, this is a major cause for concern. Her sisters and husband have stated that they will not be speaking to reporters about the case, since it's an ongoing investigation, but they have thanked her friends and family for spreading awareness about her disappearance. This is being done through flyers that have been put up in the surrounding areas, and via searches that have been conducted. At one stage, they used boats to search nearby bodies of water, but nothing was found. Amy decided to spread even more awareness by posting Christina's details on a billboard, but was told by the Lamar Advertising Company that it would cost about $13,000, which they couldn't afford. But she was delighted when the company contacted her to say that they would be providing seven billboards free of charge. A Facebook group has since been created with the details on the case and a plea for anyone who knows what happened to Christina to come forward. Then, there was a break in the case. Investigators learned that Christina was seen in a southeast Portland neighborhood on the day that she went missing, and she spent more than three hours there, but it isn't known why. But this wasn't the first time that she had traveled there. A search warrant was issued to analyze data on Christina's phone, 
and it showed that she left her apartment that morning at 6.34 a.m., the same time that she messaged her colleague. She then drove to Portland via Interstate 205 and at 6.47 took the Southeast Foster Road exit and traveled to a residential neighborhood near Glenwood Park, where she remained for about three hours. According to her cell phone data, she went to more than one house while there, but no one had any idea what she was doing in that area. Amy stated that it isn't an area that Christina would normally visit, and that her presence there that day is baffling. Then, at 10 a.m., she drove to the intersection of Southeast Flavel and 92nd Avenue, where she remained for about five minutes before her phone either ran out of battery or was turned off. But Christina had been to this same area at least three times before, and on each of those occasions, she texted her employer exactly 20 minutes after leaving home. This was an important factor in the case, since the exit to Southeast Foster Road is a 20-minute drive from her apartment. Each time that she traveled to Glenmore Park, she texted her employer to say that she would be late for her shift while her husband was under the impression that she'd simply gone to work. A short while after these details came to light, Christina's car was found parked at her apartment building in Portland, but no one knew how it ended up back there. The police were called and the vehicle was searched, resulting in another clue being found. It was discovered that the entire interior of the car had been cleaned using chemical cleaning products that had left a residue on all the surfaces. This has caused her husband and co-workers to believe that she was the victim of foul play, since this is the only explanation for why the car was so thoroughly cleaned and then returned to her apartment for her husband to find. Taking all of the clues that have been found into account, investigators believe Christina was involved in either a crime or a serious medical emergency, but what these may be remains a mystery. She remains missing today, but her husband, colleagues, and family have stated that they will all continue searching for her and spreading awareness about her case until they find the answers they're looking for. Christina is described as having grayish-brown hair, weighing around 150 pounds and standing 5 foot 8 inches tall. She may have had a black purse with her when she disappeared, but it isn't known what she was wearing at the time. Anyone with information on the case is urged to contact the Vancouver Police Department at 360-487-7500 or Crime Stoppers of Oregon at 503-823-4357. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.